Good afternoon and welcome to the Geological Society of London and to this, the fifth Society Public Lecture of 2017. It's entitled Inequality in Global Earthquake Risk Today. My name is Richard Hughes and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor James Jackson of the University of Cambridge. Uh, this has already been a very shocking century for natural disasters, uh, with over half a million people killed in earthquakes in Gujarat, Iran, Sumatra, uh, Pakistan, Haiti, and uh, China. And in the last few decades, devastating earthquakes have appeared to specifically target those population centres, large population centres, in otherwise sparsely inhabited regions, particularly Asia. So why is this? Well, the answer lies in the landscape and therefore in the geology, the rocks beneath our feet. However, the question of what to do with the huge populations in earthquake-prone megacities is one of the most pressing of our time and has no easy solution at all. Turning to our speaker, James Jackson was born and raised in India, which established his interest in all aspects of Asia, where much of his research has been focused. After a degree in geology, he took a PhD in geophysics using earthquakes to study the processes that produce major continental surface features such as mountain belts and basins. In addition to seismology, his current research uses satellite-based techniques combined with field observations to study how continents develop and deform on all scales, from the movement in individual earthquakes to the evolution of mountain belts on the macro scale. His fieldwork has taken him to many parts of Asia, the Mediterranean, Africa, New Zealand, and North America. He currently leads a project called Earthquakes Without Frontiers, a consortium of researchers in UK universities and other institutions, working with independent seismologists and social scientists throughout the great earthquake belts of the world. In 1995, he delivered the Royal Institution BBC Christmas Lectures on entitled Planet Earth and Explorer's Guide. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, and of Queen's College at Cambridge. In 2015, he was awarded the CBE and received the Wollaston Medal of this society, the Geological Society of London. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Jackson. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Um, this, the theme of this year's lectures in the Geological Society is risk, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And my main theme is to contrast uh, two kinds of experience, which is what, the, what you see in the world today. On the top picture there, you see a picture of the, of the cathedral, in fact, in Christchurch, New Zealand, an earthquake in 2011. This was an earthquake which hit a town of 300,000 and killed about 185, mostly in two buildings which collapsed. Most of the buildings, as you can see in the background, were not damaged, at least didn't uh, fall down. By contrast, underneath is an earthquake about the same size in central Iran, 2003. This killed 30% of a rural town, 100,000 people and about 30,000 died in this. And this is very much the experience in Asia. I could have used other contrasts here. The last two earthquakes in, in Los Angeles and San Francisco are about the same size. In the suburbs of Los Angeles and San Francisco in 1989 and 94, killed about 50 people each, out of something like 6 million who were exposed in each place. Essentially, the world has split into two experiences. Around the Pacific Rim, earthquakes are about money. They don't really kill people. They cause a huge amount of cost in terms of the damage, but in the rest of the world, and especially in Asia, they are about killing people in huge numbers. California will never have the experience you see in that lower photograph. Right? They, it is a, they will have earthquakes which cause a lot of damage and cause a, a lot of cost, but they won't have that experience. So that's what I want to contrast. I know a lot of you aren't geologists and don't have a geological background. There's only one bit of geology you need to know to understand my uh, talk, and that is what happens in an earthquake. Earthquakes happen when rocks break and slide past each other on knife cuts in the rock, which are called faults. So here you are looking at a picture outside Los Angeles, and what you can see is a river in the background, and there's the river, and it suddenly hits that line in the middle of the photograph and stops, and it jumps 
to the side and continues. And that offset in the river occurs on the San Andreas Fault, the famous fault, which moved in 1857 and offset that river eight metres in one go. That was the earthquake, which was the last really big earthquake they had in Los Angeles. So that's what happens in these big earthquakes. Here's a more recent example. This is a rather grainy photograph, but it shows a fault uh, from New Zealand earthquake last November, which went right through the middle of this house and offset it 10 metres. Well, you can see the offset from the road. This road was once continuous, and there it is offset sideways 10 metres. I'll show you what you see as the house has simply been pulled off its foundations. So the next picture shows a rather better view of it. Here's the fault where the background moves to the right relative to the front. And here's the house which has been pulled off its foundations because this corner of the house stayed on one side of the fault and the foundation stayed on the other side there. And so it moved like that, 10 metres in one go. This is a big earthquake. The movement doesn't have to be, it's not just horizontal like that, it can also be vertical. And here's from the same earthquake, another part of the fault where the movement was about three or four metres vertically. Now, if we look at, as Richard um, remarked in the introduction, at the last thousand years, this shows in each hundred years, here we are each century going along here, how many earthquakes have killed more than 10,000 people, or more than 50,000 in red. This is a number that's fairly robust, looking at historical records. We can be pretty, pretty sure when earthquakes have done that. And what you can see is, for a long time, these things were pretty rare, maybe one every 20 years. It was quite hard to kill 10,000 people in one go. There weren't that many places the population was big enough to do it. Once the Industrial Revolution goes and, and the population increases, that increases to about one every five years or so. And already this century, as Richard has alluded, we've had a number of, of terrible events which have killed very large numbers. I've included in green there the earthquake in Sumatra, which killed about 300,000, and in Japan in 2011, 20,000, because the, most of the people in those two earthquakes died in tsunamis. Tsunamis are a rather different story, which I'm happy to talk about in questions, but not really what I want to focus on now. What we need to know about this is, what is, why is it, why, why, what's actually going on. So if we look at the biggest earthquakes of the last 100 or so years, since 1900, 10 of the biggest earthquakes, those ones in green there, happened this century. So it's been a very busy year for seismologists and people like me. And the map shows where they've occurred. They're all, those yellow dots are all on yellow lines on the Earth, which are the plate boundaries in the oceans. Now, you've probably heard about plates. What do I mean by plates? This is a view of the world as seen by geologists, and you don't recognize it. The Earth is made of a mosaic of these spherical caps which move around relative to each other. And the reason you don't recognize what I, that picture is is because I've left the continents off. If I put the continents on, you'll see that the edges of the plates are not necessarily the edges of the continents. In fact, they usually are not. And the plates are in motion, and where they move is where the earthquakes occur, mostly at least in the oceans. Here is a map of the earthquakes in the world. The red dots are the earthquakes of the last 50 or so years. And you see these dots in the oceans, and your instincts are to join the dots with lines. You're trained to do this from about the age of five in this country with colouring books by your parents. So you join the dots, and what you see are those yellow lines, which are the plate boundaries. So those are the edges of the plates in the oceans, and that's where most of the big earthquakes occur. So all the biggest ones are there, but you'll notice there's one part which is different. So in that region there, which is Central Asia, there are no yellow lines. If I zoom in on it, you'll see why. The earthquakes are spread out over a very, very wide region. Here in the Indian Ocean, the earthquakes are localized along a line. That's the plate boundary. In Asia, only a, only a lunatic would try and join the dots. There are so many dots, you can't join the dots. They don't, they're not localized to narrow zones. So there are two consequences of this very different behavior in the continents as opposed to the oceans, especially in Asia. What it's telling us are two things. One is there are many more faults on the continents. Each of those dots is an earthquake, and each earthquake has moved a fault. There are many more of them, and yet they're all taking up the same amount of, of motion between the plates, between India here and Russia, and so each fault has to move less often. So that's one important thing. So the earthquakes repeat in the same place much less frequently than they do in the oceans. Um, and therefore, the, one of the consequences of this different behavior is that there are long periods between repeated earthquakes in the same place on the continents, very often beyond memory, beyond historic documented memory, or even never before in, in human uh, lifetimes has there been one. And this is what causes us the problem. So if we look at where people die, which is this last graph I'm going to show you, this shows earthquake magnitude here, 
And in pink, these are the number of deaths, these are people who've died in the biggest earthquakes, the ones on the edge of the oceans. And you can see, yes, these two here are the Sumatra earthquake in Japan. Almost all those deaths are in the tsunami, and I'm going to discount them for a moment. The big blue region here, where lots and lots of people have died, including these earthquakes, well over 200,000 each time, these are all in Asia. These are in the continental interiors, and that is where people die in large numbers in rather smaller earthquakes than the really big ones out here, which don't do much. And that's partly because they repeat so frequently in places like Japan and Chile that people are well used to them. They know where the earthquakes are. They're on these yellow lines. We know where the yellow lines are, the plate boundaries. You can prepare for them. The ones in the central part of the continents, in Central Asia, take you by surprise. And I'm going to show you then what is behind this. This is obviously a story at some level to do with wealth. The Pacific Rim countries, Japan, Chile, New Zealand, uh, California, obviously wealthier than the Asian countries. That's part of the story, but it's not all the story. It's also related to the geology, and that's what I want to try and get across. And I'll explain that in, in, by showing you a story. This is behind this phrase, the rich pay and the poor die, which you hear now a lot about earthquakes. That is the experience uh, that you see. Around the Pacific Ocean, you, it costs money. In Central Asia, that's where people get killed. Here's a map showing Iran and Afghanistan. And in 1994, we went to this little village, Sefida Bay, caught right on the border between Afghanistan and Iran. This was a little place, a little village, and the earthquake which happened was about site magnitude 6, and it destroyed this town and killed a couple of hundred people. And the name you'll see is part of this. Now, the interesting thing about this little village in, in, on the Afghan border is it really was in the middle of nowhere. There was no other village for 100 miles in any direction. Right? Towards the east, there's this place, the Dash de Marga, which is the desert of death, in Afghanistan, and to the west is the Dash Salut, the desert of hell in Iran, <laughs> and right between the two of them is this little village, Safida Bay, and the earthquake was precisely there. And you think, well, what's behind this? Is the earth just being vindictive? Is this really bad luck, or is this actually telling us something uh, profound? Let me show you what it actually looks like. This was the village here, which was destroyed. Here are some people for scale, and behind it is this ridge about 70 metres high. What actually happened in this earthquake was the fault was of this sort. One side got pushed up along above another. And imagine this fault here pushing this side up. Uh, and the fault dies out towards the surface. This is rather like if you have a telephone directory and you try to move the top over the bottom. Because of the binding, it'll turn into a fold. And that's what happens here. And the movement in the earthquake was only about a metre. But after many, many earthquakes, a few hundred earthquakes, you have a ridge here nearly 100 metres high. And that's what it looks like. That was what the landscape is. And so what happened here... And this, this is the fault which moves. It makes a fold like this at the surface. There was once a river which came through a gorge here, a gap, and that's where the village is. As this ridge was lifted up by repeated earthquakes again and again and again, eventually it became too difficult for the river to flow through the gap. It made a lake. It then decided to give up and just go around the end. And you can see all that in the landscape. And this next picture shows you a satellite image. The colours are a bit strange. Don't worry about that. This is the position of the village. This is a road coming through here, the white area here, the lake beds. And what you see are a whole load of streams here in the desert, and they all come back to this gap. And that's because at one time there was a river which came out this way and made all these little stream patterns here. And eventually it got blocked, turned into the lake, gave up, and now the river goes around the end up here. Let me show you what it looks like on the ground. Uh, a view looking across this gap like that looks like this. Here's the village. Here's some people for scale. These are the black rocks in the foreground down here, the black rocks in the background here, and the white rocks are the lakes, the lake sediments. So those are the lake beds, now about 70 metres above the desert floor, and this is where the river used to go. If I show you the view from the other direction now, looking from the road back to that gap, here's what it looks like. Here are the black rocks here, the black rocks there, and these are the uplifted white rocks, which were once at the same height as the desert because they were just a lake, but they've been lifted up by about 100 earthquakes to where they are now, and they are an aquifer. The lake beds actually are like a sponge. They contain what underground water there is, and as they get lifted up, they leak, and there's a spring here. So the view from the spring, here's the spring, looking down to the village like that explains what's going on. The reason the village is there is because there's a source of water. It is the only source of water for 100 miles in any direction. You have to live here. So what has made life possible is this fault, 
which is uplifting the ridge and making the water supply. That's what makes it possible to live here. The downside of this is that when it moves, you get killed. So you have to live here. It's not an accident that the earthquake happened here. It is where you have to live. And the problem, of course, is a little tiny village like this grows, and it becomes a big place. And it could become, oh, the, the clue in the name, by the way, is Safida Bay means, in Persian, white water. So it's very obvious the water is coming from the white lake beds, uh, and no one had noticed this before the earthquake. But all the clues are there in the landscape if we learn how to read the signals. And this is actually what it's about. The reason we take so much trouble to go there afterwards uh, to see what happened is to learn to speak the language. So you can look at the landscape and you say, ah, I know what's going on, I know what the threat is, I know what you're up against. But the little places turn into big places like Tehran, which now has 10 to 12 million people right up against the mountain, just like in the last place there. And we'll come back to this in a minute. So if we look at Asia, and here are the earthquakes in Asia, and the black lines show the main trade routes crossing Asia for the last couple of thousand years. This is the Silk Road system, if you want to call it that. If I take away the earthquakes, you can see what, where the trade routes go. They go along the edges of the mountains and the deserts, uh, and the high plateaus, because that's the only place you can live. There's a water supply, it controls strategic access to the trade routes and so on. And if I put on that map then, these earthquakes which have killed more than 10,000 in the last thousand years, you'll see that they mostly concentrate along those trade routes because the towns have concentrated in the dangerous places. So it's not just that the population has increased, it's increased in the wrong places specifically in the dangerous places. And a lot of these places where uh, the red dots are are places where uh, more than 10,000 were killed in the last earthquake of a few hundred years ago, but now they're mega cities of a million or two people, right? And that is what we're up against in places like Tehran, which is, which is here. So that is really the situation we're in. And if we look at these places, here are three places. Tehran is here which Tehran was destroyed in, in, in 855, 958, 1137, 1830 was the last one. So far beyond living memory, no one really thinks about this. And look at Almaty, the capital of Kazakhstan, former capital of Kazakhstan, destroyed three times in the last 130 years. Kathmandu in Nepal so many times, the last time in 2015 here. But the previous one was 1934. Almost no one around who remembers it. Right? And that is the problem. So this lack of memory as well as the populations concentrating in the dangerous places because of the geology, is the main problem in the continents. This is not a problem, for example, in Chile. Right? If you lived in Chile, you would feel a magnitude 5 earthquake every year, a magnitude 7 earthquake, much bigger than any ones I've shown you, every 10 years, and you will experience a magnitude 8 in your lifetime. So when people say this is a problem for you and your grandchildren, you believe them. This is not a theoretical statement. You know you must do something about it. And those places have become very resilient with time. So if we come back and just finish this, this tour, here's India, and this is Tibet here. And the yellow line here is the fault which allows India to slide northwards underneath Tibet. And that has produced big earthquakes recently, the one in Kathmandu in 2015 in Nepal. This one in Pakistan in 2005 killed 70,000 people out of a population of 220 or something. That's 30% again of the population killed. This is not an experience you will ever see around the Pacific Rim. Okay? But this is what happens here. And if I put on the historical earthquakes in the same place... You can see the previous earthquake in Kathmandu is 1934, 1505 here. These are way beyond living memory. So the problem is how do you actually get people to think about this kind of thing when it seems tremendously theoretical, a problem for their grandchildren's grandchildren rather than them? Of course, when it happens, like here in Kathmandu, it's very much a problem for them, as we, and we will see what I mean. So that's the background. Now, the question is really, what I want to really talk about is, is what can you do? Because I've given lots of these talks, and, and until about five, so five, six, seven years ago, I got a bit fed up. It, it seemed relentlessly bad news. You can see why this is a problem, right? It's not people behaving badly. It's the, the problem of a very long time since the last earthquake. They, all these big cities in Asia have grown up in exactly the wrong places. It's easy to just say this is terrible. What can you actually do about this? And so I got together with a bunch of friends uh, and colleagues in other countries, and we wanted to see if we could actually be part of the solution rather than just say, this is it, everyone's doomed. And uh, in particular, I want to ask the question, what can, what can geologists do? What can earthquake scientists who study these things 
contribute to making the situation in Asia rather better. This is a map which just, again, shows all the earthquakes here, and the colours on this map show the population at risk. This is the population density in places where there are earthquakes. These are all big cities of more than half a million people here. And when we looked at this map, we thought, OK, we've actually worked in all these countries over, the last, over my career um, and my friends' careers. In these areas in particular, if I put on the countries we've worked in, we had been active in all these countries at different times. We had contacts in these countries among the earthquake scientists and geologists who are interested in earthquakes. And we thought one thing we could try and do then is, is get people together to pool their knowledge, to help each other, to actually talk about the different situations in these countries and see what we can do about it. And that's really what I want to talk about now. We call this project Earthquakes Without Frontiers. I'm a bit embarrassed and apologetic about this title. It was a working title which suddenly got adopted by the Research Council that fund, uh, funded this. It is nothing like as ambitious or heroic as the Médecins Sans Frontières thing, which you've heard many times about. These are people who really do do things. We were people who were sitting about thinking what we might do. It's rather different. Um, but here's what we thought was it, what, what it was about. Here is the Bam earthquake in 2003, and here we are looking at a place where you could no longer even see where the streets were. You couldn't distinguish the streets from the houses. It was just rubble as far as you could go. This is the bazaar area. This killed 30,000 people out of a population the same size then as Cambridge, where I'm from, 100,000 people, 30,000 were killed. And this was the only person in Iran who had any idea what had happened. He was my graduate student at that time. And we thought, OK, this isn't good. What do we actually have to do? What can we do? The first thing we thought we would have to do is actually find out what they're up against. The reason places around the Pacific are now pretty resilient is because there's a conversation. The conversation happens with the geologists doing the work, saying, here's what you're up against. This is what the hazard is. They then talk to architects and engineers and planners and say, can you deal with it? And the answer is self-evidently yes. They've had huge earthquakes around the Pacific where the earthquake itself, rather than the tsunami, has done not much. And then, of course, you all both have to have conversations with the public and politicians and decision makers to prioritize this. And that means you all have to talk to each other because unless it becomes prioritized, nothing will happen. But that's what happens around the Pacific. But you have to start with knowing what you're up against. And that was clearly missing in, in a lot of these countries in Central Asia. They just haven't done the basic groundwork to know what it is they have to prepare for and where. So that was an easy thing we had to do. We thought the other thing we want to find out is, well, how do you actually turn scientific knowledge into having some effect? How do you have that conversation with people like politicians and the public? And that is essentially a issue in social science. So if I'd actually, if you had said to me 10 years ago, you will get involved with social science, I was, would have, I don't know, what are you, knocked me over the kipper, right? But um, anyway, that is clearly part of this whole story. And so actually as part of this partnership, which involves people from all these other countries, but also people in this country. So we have earthquake scientists, particularly from Oxford, Cambridge, Durham, and some social scientists from Durham and Hull and Northumberland who are involved with this partnership now, and also uh, people involved with science into policy from the Overseas Development Institute in London. That is part of what we needed to do something about this. And the third thing we wanted to do was obviously increase capability. It was one person in a country like Iran who has any engagement with modern earthquake science is just not enough. We needed to train people. We needed to help people uh, learn what we know in other places about where earthquakes happen and how. So that was the thing we thought we should do. Well, what actually happened then? What did, what did we actually achieve here? The easy, easy win was actually doing the basic geology. So here's a map, for example, of, of the north part of uh, New South Island of New Zealand. The red lines are the main faults. The, the yellow one is what made that big earthquake which pulled the, part, the house apart, I showed you here. And these lines are the faults. Now, you, these, some of these are very easy to recognize. If I show you a view looking in the direction here along this fault, the arbitrary fault, here's what it looks like. And I think you can see straight away, in case you can't, that yellow line shows you, that is where the fault is. Sometimes these things are very obvious, right? And, and yes, if you, that, that's a sort of easy win to, to identify those kinds of faults. Here's one which is less obvious. Here we are looking at Tehran. So this is the capital of Iran, destroyed four times since the start of Islam. And it's about the size of London. This area is entirely urban here. And what do you see? This is a satellite image draped over the topography. And what you might notice is some rivers here which are cutting down in gorges. Here are the rivers. 
And notice they stop at this line. And the reason they stop at this line is because it's exactly, that's a fold, it's precisely the same little cartoon that I showed you before in the desert there, where the uplift of this fold by repeated earthquakes has made the rivers cut down into little gorges, and they stop cutting down where they cross the line of the fault. In other words, those are the faults in Tehran. So here's a fault right through the middle of Tehran. This fault produced the water supply for Tehran until 1930s, and everyone sort of forgot about it, and they just built around it. So that particular fault, if I zoom in on it, here it is. About 15 years ago, the city of Tehran thought they needed some iconic monument to put them on the world map, something like the Eiffel Tower. So they built a great big tower right there. All right, and here's the 70 meters or so extra height you get from the ridge, a nice place to build your tower. And then more tragically, right next to it, they built the biggest hospital in Tehran here. So this is the thing which actually needs to be functioning after their next earthquake. And these are in absolutely the worst possible place. Right? And this is because there is no connection between the geology and, and the people who know about the geology and the people who are doing all the development. So these are the kinds of things we can do something about. And let me give you an example of how science can also help uh, more directly than this. So this is a cartoon showing what happened in the, in the Nepal earthquake in 2015. What's happening in this part of the world is India here is sliding underneath Nepal and Tibet there. And the, the boundary between the two is this line here, this black line, and that's the movement on the fault. This side goes underneath, this side is pushed out over the top. When you get down to about 20 kilometres, the rocks here are so warm that actually they have no strength. It's like toffee. It just flows. Uh, but in the shallower part up here, it's locked. So these, the, the fault is held together by friction. Right? But that doesn't stop India moving. India will continue to move. And what will actually happen as India continues to move is the whole of Nepal just gets compressed like a rubber ball. It just gets compressed more and more and more and more and more until it can't take it anymore. And then it rebounds backwards. And the next cartoon will show you this. So I, I need to ask the projectionist to just click on this. And here it is. You can see here's Tibet and Nepal getting compress, and then it rebounds backwards like that. And that's what happened in this earthquake. Now, where the fault actually comes to the surface here, it, in 1934, the last time it did this in the pool, it moved 10 metres. 10 metres is from here to the back of the room. That's an awful lot to move. And when it comes to the surface, it makes a very obvious escarpment. So here's where it came to the surface in 1934. And this riverbank was once flat at this elevation. And all this lot got pushed up into the air. So you can see this preserved in the landscape. You can take it apart. This is simply a sketch of all the details. And you can work out the history of previous earthquakes on this. So we know when there's a big earthquake, this is what should happen. It should move 10 metres and it should move all the way up to the surface. That's what happened last time. What happened this time was it only did half the job. So here's the cartoon again showing India going underneath uh, Nepal here. And this is what happened in 1934. The whole of that area in red moved 10 metres right up to the surface. What happened in 2015 is only this part moved. It moved between 20 kilometres and 10 kilometres and then stopped. So the earthquake was only did half the job. And we knew this within two or three days of the earthquake. And so we were able to say to the Nepalese government and to all the other people who are interested in all this, this isn't finished. It's still got to do this bit. Right? You cannot think just because you've had this earthquake, that's it, we're out of trouble for the next 100 years. This is unfinished business here. And also the last time it moved over this direction to the west, was in 1505, and it's just like having a crack in the windscreen of your car. You don't have to be very clever to know where the crack's going to go next. It goes in the direction where it started. And so what this has done is actually make both this part of Western Nepal and the southern part on the border of India very much more dangerous. And so the science, because we could do that within a couple of days, they're still on alert. They had a lucky escape. 10,000 people died in this earthquake, but people were expecting 100,000. Okay. So, yeah, there's an example where the science can actually help immediately in, 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 in particular ways. What else can we do? So it's not over. Here we are in Kazakhstan with a bunch of people, uh, Kazakh students and, and other people. We're taking them into the field. Again, you can see the kind of thing we're looking at. Here's a river which is cutting down into a gorge here because there's another fault at the front and so on. One of the things we discovered was actually taking local people, local earthquake scientists, into the field with people from the UK, uh, Nepal, India, Iran, Italy, all together, is actually very empowering for the local people. It actually made them feel much more, uh, if you like, um, accredited 
to the international community, part of the international community. It gave them much more credibility when they were talking to their own politicians. And we realized that during the course of this project. You could, we should have guessed this. It's kind of obvious in retrospect. We noticed it first in, in uh, about five years ago. We were asked by our, our Iranian friends to go to Tabriz. Tabriz is the old Mongol capital in northwest Iran, destroyed in, in, in the 18th century twice, killing about 200,000 people each time. Terrible earthquakes. <clears throat> they had a smallish earthquake in 2011. Uh, that got them worried. And the mayor of the city and the governor of the city were, started to get nervous. And so they, they asked our Iranian colleagues in the Iranian Geological Survey, come and talk to us. Well, the Iranian colleagues in the survey got all their international friends together from this partnership, the Earthquakes and Art Partnership, Art Frontiers Partnership. We all went off together to the mayor and the governor, and we didn't have to open our mouths. We just sat in the back row while our Iranian colleagues talked to the Iranian politicians, and we were there just so the Iranian geologists could say, do you want another opinion? Ask these guys. We are plugged into the international community. This is not some eccentric view from the Iranian Geological Survey. It's not the survey trying to get money for its own organization for the government. This is how it is. And the whole thing, that took all the heat out of the, the, the possible confrontation of foreigners going and preaching to, to other people. None of that. It was extremely positive and enabling. So that we've done quite a lot of. Because actually, once they realize, once the politicians realize that it's a real problem, nearly always the first reaction is, oh, I'm glad you've told us about this. We hope you'll fix it. And what they mean is they hope, I will say, it'll be Wednesday 9.30, right? <laughs> that you can predict it on some short time, and we can't. So the big, one of the big problems in this part of the world is earthquake prediction. You cannot predict earth, the timing of earthquakes. You can say quite a lot about where they'll be, how big they'll be, what sort they'll be, is the movement up or down, sideways, all this kind of stuff, but you can't say when. And this is a famous quote from Charles Richter. You've all heard of the Richter magnitude scale. It's in the newspapers the whole time. And when he retired, he said, basically you can read it, but for years I fought a losing battle to keep away from the involvement with the notion of earthquake prediction. The press and the public will go toward the suggestion of prediction like hogs to the trough. Meanwhile, other objects of investigation are neglected or distorted, and aid is given to the people who would like to forget the fact that for public safety we don't need prediction that earthquake risk can be removed almost completely by proper building construction and regulation. He's absolutely correct. And this is the big problem. As long as you allow the public or politicians to have the slightest belief in some silver bullet of earthquake prediction, they will do nothing. They will not take responsibility for the things you can do which save lives. And that was what was responsible for the big... Um, tragedy of the L'Aquila earthquake in Italy in 2009, which led to a trial of the seismologists. So six of my colleagues, the seismologists, were charged with manslaughter and convicted. Uh, and they were finally, the thing came to an end about a year ago, and the, the last appeal just threw it out in no time at all. They were all acquitted. But it's an example of what happens if you allow the public to believe that one day there'll be earthquake prediction. Once they started to, to charge them with manslaughter on the grounds of not predicting the earthquake and the entire international community said, this is absurd, we can't predict earthquakes, they kept changing the goalposts. Oh, this was giving out inadequate information or bad display of, of, of public knowledge or something. But in the end, the public wanted someone to say, Wednesday is the night to leave your house and sleep in the car and it's more dangerous than Thursday or Friday. We cannot do that. Again and again, the scientists said, you live in the most dangerous part of Italy. The best thing you can do is make sure your house is safe. People wouldn't, weren't interested. And so this is the big battle we're finding. This is a picture from a Chinese colleague here saying the, the trade-off. This is when you, when you have an appetite for short-term forecasting. When pe public believe in that, you get these enormous disasters. Loads of people die. In places like Chile and Japan, no one cares two pins about earthquake prediction. And they just build good houses, and they are much more resilient. So this is the direction of paradise. This is of hell. It's not true. The reason people don't die in the Pacific is not because you can predict earthquakes. It's because they actually do the things you can do to save lives. So what do we do? If you actually go to places like Tabriz, here we are, and you explain to the mayor and the governor what's going on, the near, the nearly always, once you got rid of the earthquake prediction thing, they say, well, wait a minute, everyday life in these cities is really horrible. You have all these problems. It takes forever to get to work. The traffic's appalling. There's terrible congestion. The air quality is appalling. Water quality is appalling. Blah, 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 blah. Poverty. And now you're saying earthquakes. Well, hey, when was the last earthquake? 300 years ago. <laughs> Problem for my grandchildren's grandchildren. So what do you do? Is it actually hopeless? And what I want to finish with then is some stories which I think rather inspiring, which we've, we've collected 
over the last five years of people who are not prepared to say it's hopeless but actually want to do something about it. Um, I want to start with some... <laughs> this, is a fa this is the famous quote that it's not earthquakes that's kill people, it's buildings. Right? And that's more or less completely true. It's not quite true when you have landslides which can bury people. But that's, that's good enough. It's buildings which really matter. Now, here's an interesting story. So this is in Nepal, an, an outfit, an NGO called the National Society for Earthquake Technology, run by this uh, splendid man, Amod Dixit. And we, had a, we were hosting a meeting with him two weeks before the Kathmandu earthquake. The Earthquakes Out Frontiers crowd gathered there to do what we now do routinely. He wanted us to be there so that he could show his politicians he's connected to the international community, he's not exaggerating what's likely to happen, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So that's why we were there. Well, what has he done? He had done some really inspirational things. He said, look at, the, look at Nepal. If you look at Nepal, 90% of the buildings in, in, in rural Nepal are built by the people who are going to live in them, village masons. Right? A tiny percent are built by, uh, by proper engineered architectural sort of people. Uh, and if you look at where the money goes, it's the other way around. Almost no money goes towards the masonry built, uh, the, the buildings built in villages by the people who live in them, or the money goes to the, the more engineered structures. What we need to do is focus on the masonry built houses in the villages. And he said, right, there are 10, 10 reasons why these things fell down. And this, you can't read this, but these are 10 points which say if you're building a house out of masonry, stones or brick or whatever, here are the things which matter. How you actually bind the corners together, where you put the openings for doors and windows, how you fix the roof, all these kinds of things. And you can actually make these things much more safe by just knowing what you're doing. It doesn't cost more money. You just have to know that some things are more dangerous than other things. Very good. So he embarked on a big education program, training masons from the different villages. They'd then go back and say to other people, look, we should do it this way rather than that way. You can see what I mean. Here's, here are two examples. This is a, in, in rural Nepal, a typical village building built of stones, and then they have a certain amount of wood which they put across the, the ceiling to put a very heavy roof of slates on top. The walls collapse, everyone gets buried. Exactly the same materials in northern Pakistan. You'll notice there's wood within the walls. The wood are providing ring beams. They pin the corners together. And within the walls are vertical wooden posts which support the roof. So even if the walls fall over, the roof's supported independently from the walls. These are very much better buildings here. They don't build them because of earthquakes. They build them because they're constantly fighting each other and they want really strong walls. It's a different matter. But this is a much better design. Right? So what else did they do? Here's what happened in, in Kathmandu. 7,000 schools were damaged or destroyed. That's 80% of the schools in the Kathmandu Valley were destroyed by that last earthquake. Here's a picture of a school which was four stories. It's collapsed here. So this story has disappeared. These are school deaths. Fortunately, the school was empty at the time. They had had a program of, of school strengthening, and this is what they do. This is a, a, a masonry-built school, and they reinforce it. This is what it looks like afterwards. What have they actually done? I'll show you what they've done, but the first thing, which is important, is they had to actually get the local people to buy into this. So all these things about being culturally acceptable, local capability and so on, this is code for what they actually said to the villagers, all right, we're going to do something about your school, and we're going to pay for 90%. It mostly comes from foreign aid, of course, but it's a Nep Nepalese NGO. We all pay for 90%, you pay for 10%. And the villagers say, we haven't got 10%, we're poor. So they contribute 10% by the labour. And then they feel they own this school. And so when we were taken around these places two weeks before the earthquake, the villagers are very proudly saying, this is my school, I built this. And what does it look like? Inside it looks like this. So they cut channels in the walls and they cast reinforced concrete beams. And so at the end of it, it looks like a sort of packing case, ringed round with these beams. By the time they paint it, it looks quite nice inside. It looks like any other school. Now here's the thing. This was, we were taken around two weeks before the big earthquake. Of these schools, they had done 323, and every single one was completely undamaged. Amazing. 80% of the other schools were destroyed, right? Every, these schools all became the emergency coordination centres after the earthquake because they were fine. So, fantastic programme. Here's the other thing which they did. And here we are looking, and Nepal's a very interesting place. It's got these tiny people and enormous mountains. And this lady here was in charge of a particular project run by these people to empower the women in the villages. And what they did was give the women these drills, electric drills, and their job was to pin cupboards and shelves and things which might topple over to the walls by putting bolts through. And they'd done this. Um, actually, she then put, they then put a computer on top. It's not very sensible. <laughs> but this woman, 
was absolutely wonderful. And and when I you know I said to her, well you know what 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 would you like to help you? And she said, I want a hammer drill. <laughs> Brilliant answer, right? But they'd gone around doing all this to the schools. And again, two weeks later, they had the test. And so people can see that this has a really big effect, right? So again, you know, if you'd told me. Ten years ago, I'd get involved in sort of gender issues. I, I don't know what I'd have thought, right? But actually, this is an inspirational project because you get to the children and you get to the, the women, then it all just disseminates through the whole, whole community. Very, very fantastic thing. And then they produce these things. This is all done before the earthquake. The earthquake scenario in Kathmandu was actually putting a storybook, like a comic book, about what would happen in the earthquake. Uh, and uh, as a day-by-day -day story affecting this family. And day one, uh, they'd all be outside, but they're wondering where the... The, either the husband or the wife was there, the other end of town, all the bridges have broken down across the river, where are they, how do they know when they'll come back, and so on, so on, so on. By day three, everyone will be crossed through the government because there's no water supply. And the whole story just unfolded like this through the earthquake. You could read this book as the day passed after the earthquake. And so this had a big effect because it was accessible as a storybook, uh, which they had distributed widely before the earthquake. They also did things like um, raising awareness in different ways, by having uh, public meetings. Um, this is a little shake table demonstration showing what the difference between reinforcing a building and not reinforcing a building, uh, and so on. And at the same time, across the border in India, the last big earthquake in 1934 killed lots of people in Bihar, uh, in, in Patna, which is a big city in, 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 in the plain, on the Ganges Plain. And again, they had the problem, how to raise the awareness here? Well, the people in, in this place, they're worried every year the Ganges floods. So they were worried about floods. So the people in charge of the earthquake situation were very inspirational. They said, OK, people are worried about floods. We'll have a great big festival about floods. So they had the festival about floods and slipped in all the stuff about earthquakes at the same time. And this picture here, which they put in, was taken in 1934 by Nehru. So Nehru, the first uh, prime minister of India, was an interesting guy. He was an alumnus in my department. He came to Cambridge into geology in the first year. He then switched to law and went back. You know, left geology, unfortunately. But he had a very good eye, and he took some extraordinary photographs in the 1934 earthquake. And so they publicized the earthquake thing by showing all Nehru's photographs. And people went to see them because, oh, yes, this is taken by our famous founder of the country and so on and so forth. So this is another sort of thing you can do. What else can you do? This is, again, a picture of Christchurch, the cathedral, which was damaged in... Um, in, in that, the, the earthquake in 2011. And again, the problem, you tend to think, well, I can't do much about these old heritage buildings built of masonry. Right? What on earth can you do? It's hopeless. It's not hopeless. Right around the corner from this was a brewery. And this brewery, which is, again, an unreinforced masonry building, not completely unreinforced, but it's built of brick. If you look closely at it, what do you see are these little round things here. And these are what we call fish plates. They put a B, a, a, an iron bar through the building plates on the outside and clamp the building together in all these different directions. This building was untouched after the earthquake. It continues to function as a popular brewery and bar and was, was perfectly okay. And the same thing was true in the Italian earthquakes we've had over the last six months in Italy, you'll have seen in the news. And places which have been reinforced in this way, um, they're not necessarily undamaged, but they didn't kill people. They didn't fall down. And so this is, again, a sign that people... Uh, and the interesting thing about this place, which is, this is Aquata del Tronto, but this is Norcia, where this was the cathedral after the first of the earthquakes, which was damaged but didn't fall down. It fell down in the second of the, of the two big earthquakes here. And if you look again, you can see all these fish plates here, which were holding this thing together, right? So it came through the first earthquake, sure. It had the bad luck to be immediately followed by another really big one, but no one died in the second earthquake because they were all out of the buildings anyway. So this was interesting because this particular place had had an earthquake in 1979 and the local people thought, fine, we're going to do something, we're going to strengthen our buildings in this particular way and that definitely had an effect. So it's no, you, you can do things, it's not completely hopeless. So where are we? Right? What is clear in the future is that the earthquakes are going to target the weak points where people are concentrated in the worst places, where there's a huge increase in the population, a billion dwellings in Central Asia over the next 10 years, all in the wrong place. And the problem is, of course, that is, is the building quality. So most of these buildings put up since the Second World War, when these towns have, have grown dramatically, they're terrible. This is, a, I've deliberately not said where this is, this is in former Soviet Central Asia. These are prefab concrete slabs stuck together like this. This is how you build them. Right? And this is how they actually perform, not surprisingly, in earthquakes. So here's one in, Man in, in Armenia, 
1988 here, Scopje 1963. These are terrible, terrible buildings, right? And that is part of the problem. So actually, this person here, who is well known to some of you, he is the person um, responsible for this, this phrase. Nick Ambraces was the William Smith medalist in, the, in, in this uh, society a few years ago. He was the great giant in this area, and he, towards the end of his life, said, I'm fed up with talking to all these people. One of the real problems is corruption. Right? You can have building codes. Here are building codes. Um, but in many places, they're simply decorations or empty words. No one actually takes any notice of them. And uh, it's no good saying earthquakes are, are acts of God. They're often acts of negligence. People just don't follow what we know works. Around the Pacific Rim, they do. In Central Asia, they don't. So what do you actually do about it? Well, this is the problem. Right, all Central Asian cities, here's Tabriz again, are essentially building sites. Huge building boom. And the building boom could, if it was used properly, be an opportunity. Right? And that sounds odd. Right? They, yes, they are putting up terrible buildings. Right? But people know how to put up buildings which won't fall down. They really do. Right? The question is to make sure that's what they do. Right? That they don't cut corners through corruption, through ignorance, through wanting to save money. Uh, but they've obeyed the right thing. So what's an example of that? A really interesting example is from Los Angeles. In 1933, there was an earthquake at Long Beach, the harbour of Los Angeles area. It happened during the night, and it destroyed a lot of masonry buildings, brick buildings like schools. Fortunately, it didn't kill many people, right? Um, but it scared everyone. And so 1933, that was when they introduced the building code in Los Angeles. And not only the building code, they introduced some very tough legislation still in place about monitoring that building code and getting inspectors who really do check that it's watched at every level in the construction industry. And then, at the, interest, the interesting thing is, when, in 1933, they said, well, what, but what do we do? We have all these existing buildings which are not very good. And they made this strategic decision to do nothing about them. They said, OK, we can't do anything about those. Any new building, any modification, any development which is new to any of these buildings, you enforce the building codes. And since that time, they've had eight decades of good luck. There's not been an earthquake. And as you can see from the examples I gave you, your chances are you will get eight decades of good luck. And meanwhile, Los Angeles has grown and grown and grown and redeveloped. And all the three-story buildings have been knocked down to make four-story buildings. But as soon as they do that, they have to obey the new code. And it's followed with a real rigor and determination by the government to actually make sure people follow these codes. Right? And so actually, the development of the city, the generation of the city itself, has made it more resilient. So Los Angeles is now in an extremely good situation. All the old heritage buildings which were vulnerable, which are worth doing something about, have all been retrofitted and strengthened. The ones which are unsafe have simply disappeared in the development of the real estate in Los Angeles. And that kind of thing could happen in Central Asian cities, right, where the central, especially the downtown areas, are just constantly being redeveloped. And with the right will, uh, things can be done, I think, to, to make it better. So we've learned a lot of lessons in this Earthquakes Without Frontiers project. I, I think we've been very naive. We didn't know what we were getting into. Um, we were trying to see if, as geologists, we had anything to contribute to making these places in a slightly less awful situation than they clearly are. And um, I think some of the lessons we've learned have, have been interesting and, and uh, worth uh, trying to do something about. And that's, that's what I think the future will be for us. Because I think, I mean, just to end, what people are doing is concentrating on the immediate task in hand, which is living. And that daily life in these cities is terribly difficult and, and sort of unaware of the threat which is underneath them. And so the Nepal earthquake was very, very interesting, that we got all the standard responses two weeks before the earthquake. Oh, my life is dominated by taking two hours to get to work, and the water supply is irregular, blah, 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 blah. But when the earthquake happens, it just overwhelms everything. Thank you. I'll stop now. Thank you very much, James. I'm sure there must be a lot of questions in the room. Who'd like to start? Uh, lady in the back. Hello. Um, yes, I just wanted to ask you what work um, Earthquakes Without Frontiers has done um, in relation to the recent earthquakes in Italy. Yes, so we have been, I have just came back from there last week, actually, working uh, with our Italian friends. Um, Italy, th so this partnership, this, this group, 
involves some countries which are extremely sophisticated. E uh, Italy has some of the world's leading earthquake scientists. They don't need help on the earthquake science and people like me. Uh, and likewise, our Chinese colleagues are fantastically sophisticated, really, really good. But the, our Italian friends going to places like Kazakhstan and Nepal and India and saying, here's where you'll end up if you allow people to believe in earthquake prediction is a very powerful message. That story of the L'Aquila trial of the seismologists being um, uh, found guilty of manslaughter is a very powerful message to send out. Um, and so they, uh, they feel like we do, that they want to actually do something about it. So that that is uh, our engagement in Italy has been partly that, but also partly, as you can perhaps notice from the start of the talk, the way the faults move is different. Some move up and down, some move sideways. And so in Italy, mostly it's up and down movement, which is also, it turns out, what is mostly the case in northern China, where a lot of, a lot of big earthquakes have killed large numbers of people. So the Chinese are very interested in learning to read the landscape, as they are in Italy, and so they have a lot to share in common. It, most of northern China is covered by dust, which is wind-blown dust from the, old, from the last ice age, dust on the edge of ice sheets. And so in China, it's a matter of trying to lead, un understand the signals in the landscape if it's underneath a carpet. Right? In Italy, it actually turns out to be very easy to see what's going on. So there's, there's a real exchange of, of proper scientific expertise as well as this wish to actually uh, learn from other countries how to have this conversation from the geologists to the architects and engineers through to the public. Uh, thank you. That was a very fascinating talk. Um, I'm particularly interested in your kind of use of resilience and saying that maybe p the Pacific Rim societies have great resilience today, but the Central Asian Mediterranean um, area doesn't. And this is exactly the opposite of what Eric Force has put forward in his books on the impact of tectonics on ancient civilizations, where along the, uh, pale, uh, along the, the Tethi zone, you have the development of civilizations precisely because they're confronted with these earthquakes along these tectonic lines. Do you have any comment on that? Not really. I, I'm afraid I don't know the book. I, um I, yes, I, I'm not using the word resilience perhaps as carefully as you'd like. I, what I care about is lives lost, right? If I lived, I, as indeed I did in San Francisco, I, right on the San Andreas Fault, I didn't lose a wink's sleep. I know it's not going to kill me. Right? It will cause inconvenience and a lot of money and damage and that kind of stuff. I, I, you know, I don't sleep well in Tehran, mm. right? <laughs> that is the difference. And so that is what I wanted to do something about. Yes, the next big earthquake in Tokyo will have such an enormous financial effect, it will affect the world's economy. There's no question about that. But the, put it in context, the last big earthquake in, in Los Angeles at Northridge, the total cost was 1% of California's GDP. The last earthquake in Haiti, the total cost was 150% of the nation's GDP. Right? That's what I mean by resilience, right? Um, in this case. So it's not that the money is not important, it's just that every aspect of it is so much more devastating in these places in Central Asia. There are 30 million people in Tokyo. Yeah, and I think a worst case scenario is maybe one or two thousand are killed out of 13 million. 30,000 died in BAM. 30 million. 30, yes, well, so the last earthquake uh, which affected Tokyo it was 2011, right? That was the third biggest earthquake of the century, of, of, of the last hundred years, rather. It was a lot bigger than anyone anticipated. It affected Tokyo with 30 million, and three died. Right? And that was an earthquake which lasted, I think, about two minutes, right? The one in BAM, which killed 30,000 people, lasted 10 seconds, right? The one in New Zealand was the same size as the one in, in Nepal. It lasted two minutes. It killed one person. The one in Nepal killed 10,000 in Kathmandu Valley. Right, so these are just, just not the same experience, really. It's not, I'm not trivialising it. It will have a... What about Kobe? Well, Kobe killed 5,000 out of a few million who were exposed to that earthquake. In somewhere like Iran, if they get away with 5,000 killed in Tehran, right, that will be an enormous success. Right? Uh, Kobe had, yes, I mean, Kobe was a bad earthquake and it killed, and there, there's actually more interesting stories about Kobe, why it killed people where it did, right? Um, there was liquefaction in, of, of some parts of the harbour, uh, yes, but, but nonetheless, the numbers speak for themselves, I think. Uh, in engineering in the past, uh, I was very well aware that, that most of the design seemed to go into horizontal shaking. Uh, and, and we didn't think about the vertical shaking much. Are these retrofit, uh, fit, 
jobs, are they, are they just as capable of dealing with vertical movement as horizontal? Well, I think buildings are generally better at vertical than horizontal. You're right that they concentrated on the horizontal. Yeah, what, what, what tends to happen was when there were bridges in the States that just the, the columns weren't able to... Yeah, some them. of the columns shattered. Suddenly yes. you go up to yeah. two times yes. your, your, the loaded foot design for because the, the acceleration is... Well, indeed. So the, the, the earthquake in Christchurch in 2011 had the largest acceleration we'd ever seen vertically, which was 2G. But most of the buildings were okay. Two collapsed, right? But mostly they, they were okay, at least okay in the sense of not collapsing. The one of the problems is what do you do if it's damaged but hasn't collapsed? Can you actually then repair it or do you have... But that is essentially a question for insurance in those places. That was a lo lovely talk. Um, tectonic movements are going to... Hang on, there's a person behind you. Oh, I've got the mic. <laughs> Tectonic movements are going to carry on, and certainly uh, India's pushing a bit hard, and so things are getting a bit higher, uh, and elsewhere they're, they're carrying on pushing, so earthquakes won't stop, and whether it's partial or fully, it won't stop. Um, and buildings, if you like, with your knowledge and others, are improving. So, if you like, stuff from previous uh, can be improved upon by new buildings. Um, but in the next 50 years or so, there will be more earthquakes because the things are moving. Uh, what are your, I was going to say predictions, but what are your, what's your advice to people about that? Well, I, I think if you take the right steps, you can become more resilient, to use that word again. I mean, Chile had the biggest earthquake of the last 120 years in 1960, and then they had about the fifth or sixth biggest in 2010. And the one in 2010 hit Concepcion, a city of a million people, and something like 200 died, again, mostly in the tsunami, rather than the collapsed buildings. And it was an absolute triumph for the earthquake engineering profession. Um, again, they're helped in Chile by having so many earthquakes, people know this is not a theoretical issue. It will affect your life. But the earthquake engineers in Chile say to me, um, when they build buildings now, apartment blocks and so on, um, you might think it'd be OK if the building was damaged, but people aren't killed. And they say that's just not acceptable to the public. If the building is damaged, they will sue you and they will win. So actually, they now very much over-engineer and, and extremely conservative about the way they do things. And these, uh, for the more engineered buildings, these, are, these people are using expertise which is widely known around the world and, and very often the same consulting engineers. I mean, it turns out the UK has extremely good consulting engineers building these kinds of buildings and very respected good people they are. Right? So I think the knowledge is there. And that, as I say, that Japan earthquake in 2011 was 10 times bigger than anyone thought there would be. And the earthquake really didn't do much. It was the tsunami which did the, did the problem. There was a fascinating talk here given by a colleague of yours, I think it was Professor Wells from, um, from Leeds University, on predicting where uh, earthquakes might, might um, arise. And um, he was quick to say we knew exactly where all the tectonic plates are, and he made reference to Tehran. But uh, it was impossible to actually say when the earthquake is going to be. I know that's not your main point, but uh, it's really the point that the rich nations have the technology to build buildings which withstand earthquakes. The poor don't. That seems to be the nature of what, some of what you're saying. It's ironic that uh, Los Angeles has, I believe it's six hospitals built straight along the San Andreas Fault. Is that, is that true? I don't know if that's true, because the San Andreas Fault itself is a little bit behind uh, Los Angeles. They have hospitals which have been through some pretty big earthquakes and, and, and without much damage. The last one in 94, they had a, the University of California, Southern California Hospital was built on these so-called base isolators, on essentially rubber blocks, <clears throat> and the hospital felt hardly anything at all. Uh, you can do these things. Um, but only if you can afford it. Yes, but there are an awful lot of things, uh, the, the kind of... Um, error, corruption, call it what you want, that my, old, my friend Nick Amstis was talking about, was people who deliberately mis -con mix concrete badly, who don't tie up the reinforcing in concrete beams properly. A concrete frame house shouldn't fall down in a magnitude 6 earthquake, but they routinely do yeah. in Central Asia. And that's simply a matter of actually doing what you're supposed to do in terms of mixing the concrete properly, um, tying the reinforcing together, not putting openings in the wrong place, making sure you have 
the slabs for the roof and the ceiling in the right place, all this kind of stuff. It's, it's more not doing, not cutting corners to save cost and time, uh, which if you were generous, you'd say is ignorance. If you were not, you'd say it's corruption. Right? And that's what matters, right, really. Absolutely. Thank you, very, very interesting talk. You showed an interesting map showing the Indian plates abducting below Asia, going from um, Kabul in the west right through to China right. in the east. There was a big gap in the middle there. Yes. Is that an area where you're concentrating on mitigating? Yes, there's a big gap just north of Delhi, where we don't really know when the last one was, but we think it was the 15th century. The record's not terribly good. Um, partly because uh, it was not much populated and a lot of, the, lot of the records come from monasteries in Tibet. And it, it's quite hard to pin down. So the, 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 you know, the monasteries are fairly distributed around Tibet and it's hard to tell quite where the earthquake was. So the, the knowledge is patchy um, up there. But no, the, the, where they, I mean, it all must move at some time. And where there hasn't been one for a long time, yes, I mean, you'd imagine that's, that's where the stress is a place up. worth watching. Yeah. Thank you. I wondered if you could say anything about the Bandaratje earthquake in 2004. Yeah. Because you mentioned the huge tsunami. Yes. And um, just one thing, I saw some, I know that after that earthquake, I think it was Woods Hole did a seabed survey, and there were blocks on the seabed which were 13 metres up in the air. Yes. So you Move on that. that. The maximum slip was about 25 metres in that earthquake, really? in, in patches just off southwest of Bandaratje. The, um, again, the, what really killed most of the 200,000 people were the tsunami, was the tsunami. It was a huge, huge, huge earthquake. It's the second biggest of the last 120 years. So by contrast with that one in Iran, which lasted 10 seconds, the one in um, Bandarache lasted eight minutes. Right? I mean, the fault was 1,200 kilometers long. That's from here to Rome, right? I mean, it's really an awful lot of stuff to move around. Changes the gravity field of the Earth. You can detect this from satellite. But what, what killed people was the tsunami. And, and people die in tsunamis mostly because they don't know what to do. Um, if you're on the beach, um, on, on the landward side, generally the sea disappears first. The sea disappears and people don't know what to do. They go down and see all the fish flapping around on the beach. And then the sea comes back. And you have 20 minutes, right? And um, it so happens that the way the geometry works in these places is you have about 20 minutes. You can get a long way with 20 minutes with a bit of motivation. But mostly you need to go up. And the problem is, on, on the flat, there's nowhere to go. And that's the other reason people die. So people died in Japan, not because they didn't know what to do. Every Japanese knows exactly what to do, which is to get onto high ground. And places where there was high ground, they all went onto high ground and were fine. People drowned in the Sendai Plain, where it's flat. And the only thing you can do, which they'd all been trained to do, was to get onto the roofs of high buildings. Essentially things like multi-story car parks where the wave is supposed to go through. But the wave washed them off the top. And that was because there was a, the tsunami in that particular earthquake was bigger than anyone had anticipated. And partly that was because the, the, they hadn't had one that big in the last thousand years, so they didn't quite know how to do it. And it, ironically, about a year before that earthquake, someone had actually discovered a tsunami that was much bigger, which had gone much further inland, and the deposits from that had been discovered um, much further inland than other tsunamis, and then the people were waking up to the fact there were some bigger ones, but they hadn't actually got around to doing anything about it. So, uh, and the reason it was so big, um, there, there's a particular class of earthquakes. There have been, in the last 50 years, there's been one in Nicaragua, two in Java, the Sumatra one was one, another one, and there was another one halfway down um, Sumatra, and then the Japan one, which make much bigger tsunamis than they should do. And the reason for that is there was another process going on, which we hadn't really known about or understood. We could see that these earthquakes were special in some way, but we didn't know why until the Japan one happened. In Japan, the information that was available was so good, I think we do now know what that extra process is, and I think we even know how to recognize the places which are subject to it. And that will have a, an effect, I think, now. But the tsunami is uh, a bit of a tragedy. If you, you shouldn't drown if you know what to do and if, if there's the, the ability to get out of the way. You have 20 minutes, which is actually quite a long time. <coughs> car. Cars are bad because actually the roads clog up. Much better on foot. Uh, how well prepared are the municipal authorities in Istanbul for earthquakes? Because uh, I'm going on holiday there. Yes. <laughs> Will I lose any sleep? <laughs> yes. 
but this is a hard one to answer. <laughs> so the Istanbul has had many earthquakes in the past, of course, uh, some of which have been destructive. The, of course, no one knows when the next one's going to be. To the east of Istanbul, the earthquakes are much bigger than actually at Istanbul and south of Istanbul. The, the fault line which actually does the damage goes from Iran right across northern Turkey and out into the Aegean Sea through the Sea of Marmara and the Dardanelles. Uh, the, what decides how big the earthquake is is how long the fault is which moves. And the fault segments which move to the east are very large and, and make earthquakes as big as the last ones in 1999. Um, there's some argument about what's underneath the Sea of Marmara, whether they're quite as large or not. And in fact, um, the person I showed, Nick Ambrose, is up there, and I did some work on that, because looking historically, there haven't been any earthquakes uh, south of Istanbul as large as that one in 1999 and further east. So I think at the moment it looks to me as though the earthquakes are not quite as big in Istanbul as they are to the east, if that's some consolation. But uh, certainly plenty of earthquakes, and who knows when. But the Turks are trying to do something about this. Right? They are... They are uh, trying to do something about retrofitting buildings. Try, they, they're vetting very tough on the construction industry now and quite prepared to prosecute people who build buildings which are bad. Um, so I, I, there are some positive stories coming out of, of Turkey, actually, of that sort, anyway. Um, you say you can't predict earthquakes, but can you get some early warning from any movements of the surface of the Earth from satellite measurements? Not from satellites. So that, well, let me say a couple of things. Um, prediction is a word we have to use very carefully. I was very careful to say what you can't do is the short-term prediction. Right? Long-term prediction is what I mean talking about. Where they've happened in the past, they'll happen in the future. And as a way of raising public awareness, that's perfectly valid. Right? It's not saying when they'll happen, but it's saying if you had one here before, you'll have another one. So you better prepare for it. So that's, that aspect of it is fine. What we can do from satellites is monitor, when I showed you Nepal crumpling up like a rubber ball before it finally expands again, we can monitor that from space easily. So from space, using GPS, which is what you use for sat-navs in your car, it'll tell you where your car is to within a metre or two. The way we use it, you can monitor things moving the rate your fingernails grow from space. A millimetre a year, easy. This kind of thing students do in their projects. Right? So you can do that. You can see these places accumulating the kind of strain. What you can't do is say when they're going to break. Right? Uh, it's like having a ruler. You can bend it, but you don't know where it started, and you don't know how far it's got to bend before it actually breaks. But you can see that you can see the squeezing or the stretching that's going to cause it, yes. So to some extent, you can identify the dangerous places in that way. So if you look at, look at the interior of India, for example, the Indian Peninsula, it's really not doing anything at the level of even one millimeter a year whereas Nepal is being squashed up at 20 millimetres a year. Sorry, another question. Um, you were talking about the Sandiku earthquake and said that it gave you data for the secret ingredient on these really devastating tsunamis. As I, I was hoping you would tell us what that is. Oh, I can a little bit. The, um, the way that works offshore is the Pacific Ocean is sliding underneath Japan and it rucks up all the sediment. The Pacific Ocean floor has some sediment on top. It all just gets scraped off and makes a pile, makes a wedge which gets steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper until it eventually can collapse. Right? If you make it too steep, it, it, it's like a landslide, except it works in a particular way, whereas the, where the fault actually doesn't dip towards the ocean, it dips towards the land. And then what you have is like a triangular wedge at the front. It's rather like if you imagine a wooden wedge on the floor, a triangular wedge, and you step on it, it'll shoot forward. And that's a process which actually gives you an extra oomph to the tsunami right at the front of the, um, the slope going down into the deep water. And that's what happened in, in Japan. And what it leaves behind is that triangular shape. And so afterwards, if you go and look at the shape of the seabed, you could actually see that triangular shape. And then you can go around the coastline. Uh, other parts of Japan behave like that. Other parts don't behave like that. And you can go around the Pacific and identify the places which are prone to that sort of failure. Right? And so I think that's, that's what we've learned from that. 